Okay, we're good. Uh, the first time I visited Smith Lake State Wildlife Area in the western Nebraska Sand Hills, I didn't think much of the place. I, I may have been the swing set and the merry-go-round at the entrance room. And so I just headed down the highway. I came back the next spring, though, and I found this osprey spearing fish in an inlet at the north side of the lake and got to pet this female snapping turtle while she laid her eggs right on the entrance room. And I was beginning to catch the flavor of the place. So I set my tent up in this ponderosa pine woodland with a nice view of the lake, not knowing that I'd spend 300 nights of my life camping out here alone over the next 30 years. So I fell in love with the light, the glowing light, the thunderstorms that would rumble through in the afternoon, uh, beautiful cattail marshes, all the wildflowers, the um, penstemons, the spiderwort that would just carpet whole hillsides in June. Um, that was a shelly penstemon. And all the wildlife I would see on the entrance road, such as this racer and uh, this, of course, um, ornate box turtle who was going down to the lake to get water. And then just behind my tent, there was a family of long-eared owls, the first one I'd seen in western Nebraska. And they would hoot me to sleep at night. And during the first three years or so, I was adopted by a wild turkey. This is Roxanne. <laughs> go on long walks around the lake, gobble at her, and she'd run up and jump into my lap. So I began to think the place was a little enchanted. This um, white-tailed doe was quite courageous. She'd come up to within about four feet of me when I was sitting in a, by a tree reading. And at first I thought she was friendly, then I realized she had a fawn lying in her, and I learned to, to just give her a white at birth. And at night I would hear as many as nine owls calling all at once at Smith Lake. Um, of course, the great horned owls, there are always at least two pairs there. And you hear them year round, but there used to be at least two pairs of eastern screech owl who nest in the cottonwoods. And so I thought it was a pretty good place. So I, I went back in August and I was amazed. It was just as beautiful. I love doing this, Dave, is looking at uh, wild licorice birds to see who's sleeping there every morning. This is an emerald green sweat bee. And I love the, the dew on the uh, dragonflies or their saddlebags or whatever kind of dragonflies in the morning. And I fell in love with the blooming tall grasses. Many of us don't get to see blooming tall grasses. This is big blue stem. This is my favorite wildflower in North America, switchgrass. And I love the magenta stigmas and the um, orange male parts there. And even in late summer, it can be very green at Smith Lake because the sand hills capture so much moisture. And even into October, right now, you get the most beautiful blue in the night. Uh, October is a great month to look at the sand blue stem. And, um, and then you get the late fall butterflies, as well as, what else do we have? Of course, the monarchs still passing through until about the 10th of October. So, I was standing there one October day and in the dusk light and all by myself, no one around and a few hundred sandhill cranes flew over. And I really realized I had discovered an enchanted place. And I've been in love with the place ever since. I didn't start winter camping there until about four years ago, but it's just as beautiful in winter. And on this particular evening, I think I heard seven calling owls as I turned in. Again, there was great horns eastern screech owls. And as I woke up the next morning, I heard this cacophony down at the south end of the lake, and there were more than a thousand uh, Canada geese. But as I looked closer, there was a family of trumpeter swans. And this was the first trumpeter swan family I'd seen at Smith Lake after going there for something like 34 years. So I was quite excited. So my favorite day of the year is always the first Monday in June when I do my annual breeding bird survey uh, at Smith Lake. I've done it for 25 years. I use the atlas approach and just count all the birds I see are here and 
categorize their behavior. And I also do point counts. And uh, using these two techniques over 25 years, I've documented 124 potential nesting species at Smith Lake. Well, we did uh, 1,800 10 square mile blocks for the Colorado Breeding Bird Atlas II in the state of Colorado, and only one had more than 124 potential nesting species. Smith Lake is one square. So I wanted to share those results with you because I don't know how many 25 year breeding surveys are out there. Uh, first of all, I didn't see dramatic changes in the bird populations. Um, I, we're getting a few more eastern species coming in as the trees move westward. And uh, grassland species don't seem to be doing quite as well there. And I'll talk about that in more detail as we move along. But most of the birds on these lists are just sort of rare migrants. Uh, edge of range species. This doesn't tell you much. Here are the point count stations. I have 10 of them. I do a 10 minute count and count all the birds seen within 100 meters. And again, I do it on the first Monday morning uh, in, uh, in June. So I'm pretty consistent about the timing of it. There are some windy days and that throws the bird numbers down. So, if we're gonna look at the numbers, here they come. Here's a pretty straight line for you. This is the number of species observed from the point count stations. And I, they call that a trend line, but I don't see a trend. Um, no change. Uh, total individuals, it sort of might be going down, but actually if you see that one way up there, that diamond, if you take that year out, it's absolutely flat. And I'll tell you what that year is all about here in a little bit. So the increasers, you could guess these wood duck, turkey vulture, and great crested flycatchers, they're moving west with the trees. The decreasers, we have several marsh species, marsh wren, yellow-headed blackbird, and we also have uh, some prairie species, western metal lark and long-billed curlew, and also grasshopper sparrow. So what's going on with the marsh wrens? Uh, they're increasing throughout much of North America, but not at my study site. And it took me a long time to figure this out, but then I noticed that the same thing is happening with yellow-headed blackbirds. Now, what both these species require are cattails that are immersed in water, because they're not very good at keeping predators out of their nests. So they like to have deep water and cattails. And you'll see both of them seem to have you know, decreased by about 50% here in 25 years. Well, I started looking around. I noticed the cattail marshes at Smith Lake were growing smaller. And right below my tent site, there was a cattail marsh, which is now just a narrow strip of cattails. So I wondered, what's that all about? And then I noticed that many of my point count stations were in areas where the cattails had been diminishing. So started thinking about it. I'll come back to it in a minute. As to the grassland species, that's pretty dramatic. Uh, I haven't been hearing curlews at Smith Lake the last half dozen years, and I just always heard them the first few years. Grasshopper sparrows, this has been happening throughout much of Colorado. They just seem to be decreasing. Now, what curlews and grasshopper sparrows have in common, they like mixed grass and short grass prairies that have a lot of bare ground where they can hunt for insects, especially grasshoppers. Now, here's a pretty dramatic picture. On the right is the Hinn Ranch, a private cattle ranch. On the left is Smith Lake State Wildlife Area. Smith Lake has not been grazed for 70 years, and there have been no prescribed fires. I can hear the curlews on the Hinn Ranch falling away in the spring, but I can't find them at Smith Lake anymore. Uh, there was a famous study at Conza Prairie. Many of you have been there. And they found that the best predictor of breeding bird abundance was areas that had been recently burned and grazed by cattle. And the lowest breeding bird abundance is areas that haven't been burned and haven't been grazed. 
So on the prairie, burning and grazing are necessary. And then we've got this tree invasion. These are all what they call red cedars. You call them junipers here. And they are providing perches for grackles and red-tailed hawks and great horned owls, and they're fragmenting the prairie. So I think that's what's happening there. We just don't have a natural prairie there. Now, looking at the individuals, I was really intrigued by that peak in 2003. What was significant about 2003? Does anyone remember? The third year of the worst drought to hit the West, uh, to hit Western Nebraska in this century. Now, this is what uh, Western Sandhills looked like in the late 1990, I mean, 2010s, which was the wettest, the wettest uh, decade in this century, where you had the Ogallala Aquifer come up over the uh, roads and so forth. So I got on this, and so I said, well, let's compare uh, precipitation with numbers of birds I see. There's a very powerful inverse relationship. The drier it is, the more birds I see. Can anyone tell me why? You'll get there. <laughs> well, it turns out, and we did some work at Boulder Reservoir on this, when you have very wet years, is even the water level comes up just a few inches, and you have violent uh, summer thunderstorms, the wind action from those thunderstorms washes away the cattails. So we have a reduction in cattail marsh during the wet years. Meanwhile, the interdual valleys, we're getting these emergent wetlands created in these wet years. And these are much better for uh, marsh birds. They're more multidimensional. But as it dries out again, those birds have to go back to these large lakes. So the lakes serve as refugia for marsh birds during the dry years. Well, I find this fascinating because it's counterintuitive. Everything in the sand hills is counterintuitive. But we get so carried away thinking of megatrends like climate change and insect die off and so forth. Sometimes we forget to look at what's in front of us. And what this tells me is that High Plains aquifer is driving bird populations, also known as the Ogallala aquifer in the sand hills. And we should be very aware of that and work to conserve that. I have this nightmare where Denver finds out about the Ogallala aquifer under the sand hills, just as Las Vegas has found the aquifer under southern Utah. Nebraska would never let it happen, but I'm going to be vigilant. Anyway, we hear about the draining of the Ogallala aquifer. And that's true in the southern half of it. There are many areas where it's been drawn down 150 or 200 feet. In the sand hills, it's been rising. And more than half of the uh, water in the aquifer is under the Nebraska sand hills. Now, it's rising partly because construction of a couple of dams. I'm not going to get into the details. But it's doing fine. And the reason is, of course, there's very little center pivot irrigation in areas that are all sand. Try it sometime. And um, the other thing about the Sand Hills that I love, this is the Middle Loop River. I guess most of you know by now that all the rivers and Sand Hills flow at a constant rate 12 months of the year, almost, within 5%. And that's because there's no runoff. Virtually all the rainfall and snowfall goes into the sand and down into the aquifer. And then it bursts out from the aquifer in these springs. This is Berry Falls in the Niagara Valley. This is Fort Falls. These streams bubble up out of the ground about 200 yards above these waterfalls. So you can go to places like the Snake River in winter, and the swans are overwintering on this river because there's very little ice, because it flows at a constant rate throughout the year. And there are 150 trumpeter swans along about a 1.5 mile stretch of the Snake River. So the aquifer is mega important. Here's a family just south of Smith Lake along Pine Creek. Um, again, Pine Creek is ice free, so the swans can go there and overwinter. There are otters in virtually all these rivers. Is these river otters at my campsite I call Otter Cove on the North Platte River. And they tell me where not to put my tent. 
<laughs> they chattered me at night. If I put the tent in the wrong place, one morning I woke up and there were otter scats all around the tent. <laughs> so they're pretty forthright. A black neck stilts that are now quite well established in the sand hills. Of course, ibis are doing really well. These emergent marshes are great for them. I think you know that the elk are moving out onto the plains bit by bit. Um, there's no indication of a decline in greater prairie chicken or sharp-tailed grouse populations in the sand hills. And I don't understand. There are two free photographic blinds at Crescent Lake, and I never see anyone using them. They're free. That's where I took that picture. Um, and no, this isn't a piping plover. What is it, Dave? I just lost my name. It's in federal threatened species. It was no. It was a pipe and plug. Yeah. I have no memory anymore. There's a half million, a half million, is that right, acres of bison range now in the sand hills. And now with the savory method of grazing, where they do intense grazing in smaller areas, there's much more grass in the sand hills than there was 40 years ago. Because the ranchers have really learned how to grow grass. So this makes me think if there are places like things where this where things work, you know, maybe there's hope for the rest of us. But there are some things that would concern me, and I think this is related to climate change. There's much more algae at Smith Lake, and studies have shown this is happening all over uh, the sand hills. I I don't know technical terms about pondweed and so forth and algae, but uh, this certainly affects the populations, for starters. Um, this is a beautiful picture, but what grass is this? Uh -huh. Public enemy number one, right? Smooth brome. And the smooth brome is spreading from the sides of these lakes up into the sand hills. Even though they're still dominated by native grasses, we have invasive grasses, weeds. But here's the biggest invasive we had. This is the Wounded Knee Massacre site, our cemetery. I had been camped at Smith Lake for 20 years before I realized I was trespassing on someone else's land. All of Western Nebraska belongs to the Lakota and Cheyenne nations, based on one of the trees of Fort Laramie in the late 19th century. And the Lakota and Cheyenne were given exclusive hunting rights throughout Western Nebraska and they still have them, they just haven't been enforced. So I've become aware that it's nice to wax poetic about the beauty of this landscape and how it's sort of an example of what we could be doing right. But don't forget that this has been at the expense of the people who own the landscape, all of whom were herded down to, quote, Indian country in Oklahoma and places like that. Some of you have read Cheyenne Autumn by Mari Sandoz. It depicts the heroic return of the Northern Cheyenne to their homeland in 1877, when 300 of them escaped the reservation in Oklahoma and marched all the way up to the sand hills. And this is a little lost Chokecherry Valley where Mari Sandoz said they spent their last winter of freedom. And you can go, go to little lost Chokecherry Valley and celebrate this heroic event, but it's still on a ranch that's owned by a European. Uh, there is no Cheyenne land left in Nebraska, not one acre uh, that hasn't been taken away. The Pawnee lived along the Loop Rivers, these beautiful spring-fed rivers in the central sand hills, and they were marched to Indian country in about the same time, uh, the 1870s. And there, until very recently, wasn't one acre of land that was left of the Pawnee Nation. This is Presley State Wildlife Area, where I'm going to be camping tomorrow night on the South Loop River. And this is a very sacred Pawnee site. And you see these places and experience them at night, and they are just precious. They're so beautiful with the clear spring fed water and the um, just the sense of quiet and peacefulness and the grassy hills stretching in all directions. So one thing I've been doing is working with Right Relationship Boulder to try to help some of the 
indigenous people communicate more effectively with our government agencies. And there are some things happening in every state in North America right now. Here in the Niobrara River Valley, the Ponca have reclaimed a portion of their historic lands. And they did it pretty much on their own. They lived along the Niobrara River, just near where it flows into the Missouri River. And here's one of the Ponca chiefs whose name was Standing Bear. And after they were marched south to the Indian country, and a third of his people died of various diseases, he said, I'm going home. And again, this was around 1878, I believe. He and about 150 of his relatives and followers marched back to Nebraska and demanded that they have be given their homeland back. And they got the approval of the local newspapers, and so there were a lot of European Americans who supported them. And thanks to their efforts, they reestablished the Ponca homeland where the Niobrara River flows into the Missouri River. And over the 130, 40 years since then, they built up acre by acre, 2,000 acres. And if there's nothing, if you've never done this, I can't recommend too highly that you go to the Ponca powwow in August. It's open to everyone. It's a wonderful multicultural event. And it celebrates this return of the Ponca to the Niobrara River Valley. Um, there are usually about two or 300 people there just camping on site. And it's really a joyful event. Some other good things have been happening on this front. Um, but if you look at the map, you'll see only those two red um, squares represent significant lands still occupied and owned by um, indigenous people in Nebraska. Um, but there are efforts ongoing to try to return some of the land. I've got a list of some of them. I won't read them all. They all look like small things, but they're beginning to add up. And I think especially the Ponca and the Pawnee are beginning to have a voice and lots of things that are going on in North America, in Nebraska, just as the Northern Arapaho and Northern Cheyenne and Southern Arapaho and uh, Mountain Ute communities are beginning to have a voice in our planning here on the Front Range. Uh, Keystone Pipeline has been a contributor because there have been alliances between ranchers and indigenous people to oppose the Keystone Pipeline. And as part of those alliances, uh, European American ranchers have started to give some of their land to the Pawnee and other people. Some of you will remember Roger Welsh. He had a wonderful show called Postcards from Nebraska on a Nash, I think it was ABC Sunday Morning America. And he's a folklorist. And I may, many of you may know Deb and Walter Echohawk, who lived in Boulder for some time and are now back in Oklahoma as cultural and political representatives of the Pawnee. Roger was appointed to the Nebraska Historical Society State Commission, and he thought it was a great honor until he found out that thousands of relics, including skulls and skeletons of indigenous people were being stored at the Nebraska State History Museum, and that the Historical Society refused to give any of these relics back to the people they'd stolen them from. So Roger resigned his post, started talking with her vets and his wife Kim and with Deb and Walter Echohawk about passing a statewide law to require that all these relics be returned to the people they were taken from. And Nebraska in 1998 became the first state in the union in the United States to require that this be done. And that was good, but Roger and his wife lived on 60 acres of ranch land along the middle of the river at the time. And Walt and Deborah Echohawk went to, went to them and said, you know, thank you so much, but we don't have any place in Nebraska where we can bury our relatives. We don't have one acre of land where we can bury our relatives. So that night, uh, Roger and um, 
did, Linda, I get everyone's name and stuff. Anyway, they were having dinner and she said, well, why don't we just will our land to the Pawnee? And then a few months later, she said, you know, that's crazy. Why don't we just give them that? So they gave their entire ranch to the Pawnee Nation so that the Pawnee would have a place where they could bury their departed uh, relatives. And there was skepticism about this in Danabrog. It's a little Danish American community um, where Roger and his wife live. But now this flag, the Pawnee flag, flies next to the American flag on the Danabrog courthouse. Every summer in the Danabrog annual parade, Pawnee leaders ride in the lead vehicles with the local uh, council, city council members. During the 2017 eclipse, uh, many dozen of Pawnee visitors came to their land to join with other Danabrog resident, residents to celebrate the eclipse. These things are small, but they make such a difference in the way we see the world. However, as I said, many of these sacred sites, including Little Lost Chokesbury Valley, are still on private land. So I, I spent a lot of time in my new book talking about this because I realized we can't talk about natural places and about the beauty of nature with also taking into account what sacrifices have been made by people so that can occur. But in the end, my experience with all my nights at Smith Lake is to discover a landscape that is just as beautiful as it was 150 years ago. Um, it's the quietest place I know. And it's a place where things are getting better rather than, than deteriorating. And I think what it tells us, if we can conserve landscapes, just look at the landscape. What does it need? What do the burrowing owls need? If we can act on that, there is hope for us. It may seem desperate right now, but this is what's kept me sane. I always say that Sandhills is my psychologist. This is how I avoid having to go off the deep end. So I guess to finish up, what I'd say is after 38 years, the hills around Smith Lake are still covered with native sand hills, tall grass, and mixed grass prairie. There's something coming up here. We'll see what it is. Uh, upland sandpipers still perch on the fence posts in the hills behind my tent. American bitterns by the dozens from their territories in the cattails. The long-eared owls are still nesting after 38 years, and I've heard them every summer now for 38 years. And now the trumpeter swans have returned for good to rear their young at Smith Lake. And this is one morning when they brought them right over to where I was sitting by the lake. The sunrises are still just as vibrant and beautiful. And I think there's hope for all of us. Oh, we could have questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, that was inspiring and beautiful. Thank you. You're a very good photographer. Um, so what I would like to do is allow some time for question and answer. I want to ask you to repeat every question before you answer it. Sure. Um, and to face this when you answer the questions. This thing. Okay. This thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I wanted to say something about the books right now. So. Okay. That would be great. Um, and just for everybody's sake. Towards the end of Q uh, and A, I'm going to have one brief announcement about next month's program. Yeah. But I'm going to hand it back to Steve now. If you're online, you want to ask a question, type it into the chat window. Thanks. I just want to say I don't sell books at uh, public talks anymore. I just give them away. Except I, there is a caveat: if you take a book, I ask you to donate the amount of the cover price to an organization that you like that works on grassland conservation. And I do list 
the three of the ones that I support here, they are people of the sacred land, a Boulder organization working on land back for uh, indigenous people, Friends of Sand Hills Refugees, uh, nonprofit in Valentine, Nebraska, and the Trumpeter Swan Society, which has been largely responsible for bringing the North American Trumpeter Swan population from 30 known individuals in 1930 to 65,000 today. So if you want to take a look, just all I would ask is please just indicate who you are donating to. And I can make it afterwards. Who has questions? Yeah. You were looting. If you could just repeat the question. Okay. You alluded to uh, the Red Cedars taking over the prairie. The prairie is just an article in the last um, yeah. part, of the, part of the last of the ecology issue. All about birds. It was just available online yesterday, I think. Yeah. And it's an article about the Red Cedar invasion of the prairie and what it's doing to native species. They didn't talk a lot about how it's eliminating the sand blowouts. I, I mean, they, what, no, I said that wrong. One of the reasons the cedars are invading is because there's been almost no fire. That helped to keep them at bay. The other reason is probably because the ranchers have planted them all the place. And finally, the ranchers have gotten much better at not overgrazing. But in addition to the red cedars invading, a big problem is that in the sand hills, it's the most unique, I think, environment in the sand now, is the blowouts. These are areas where the wind is sheared off the top of the grass and the top of the dunes. If you look at pictures of the sand hills from the 1890s, there are areas where the dunes were just all sand on top. And no one knows if that was because of intensive overgrazing when the Europeans first got there, or that's because of dry conditions and natural fire. But anyway, loss of their sand is what threatens, most threatens, and Dave, you may know the insects from the sand. Do you? Tiger beetles. Tiger beetles. I think of Hayden's blowout penstemon, which is the only endangered plant species in Nebraska. They're endangered, and I'm sure some small mammals. And it hurts curlews, too. Some of the short birds use those areas for foraging. So yeah, that's a great article. It's in All About Birds. Yeah. It's called, what do they call it? The Red Cedar Dam or something? Yeah. It looks to the uh, Red oh, Cedar Lake Shade. Glacier. Green Glacier. Green Glacier. But, yeah. but I have the hardest time with all the people who contact me and say, where are all the birds? Where are all the birds going? What's going on with the birds? And the biggest threat to birds in eastern Baldwin County is trees. We've lost lark bunning, almost lost burrowing owl, and we seem to be on the way to losing grasshopper sparrows, and it's the trees. And it's so hard to get people to understand that trees aren't just wonderful things for all of us. Yes. Yeah. So my question is, yeah. Um, can you, what has been done to uh, deal with that? I, I, I see in the article that's uh, described here, Burns and also uh, some tractor work, but uh, how effective do you think that can be for such vast areas involved? And I also, uh, yeah, birds themselves, I think the chickens and the species are actually spreading the seeds. Yeah. So that what he's saying is, given the extent of the spread, there's Probably millions of junipers now growing in the sand. Um, and also the fact that they're being spread even by natural forces, such as prairie chickens, so you can see this. How do we deal with this? Um, and I think I would ask Dave to comment in a minute. But I talked to the director of the Nature Conservancy Preserve at the Niagara Preserve, which is the largest TNC preserve in North America. It's east of Valentine. And he said they're out there cutting down trees every day, but if they cut down 10 a day, they couldn't keep up with it. That sounds unbelievable, that's what he said. Um, they are using prescribed fire, but you have to understand that 97% of the Nebraska sand hills is under private ownership. I think that's why I go camping. Two reasons. There aren't any birders up there, none. 
much of the bird. And second, um, it's nice to be in a place that's natural and feels natural that is, isn't a fragment of shit, where people are actually making things work. You know, it doesn't have to be turned into national wildlife refuge. So it's hard to have an organized campaign to eliminate the cedars, but I see more and more ranchers are dealing. That's all I can say. But how many ranchers have that amount of time on their hands? I think fire is the answer. What do you think, Jim? Well, I think, I mean, I think prescribed fire is probably the most effective method if and where we can do it. It's very nowadays with wildfire and more and more people on the land and once the prescribed fire gets away and sets back the use of prescribed fire for 10 years every time one of those fires jumps the jumps the uh, all the precautions that, that they take when they do a fire. Yeah. Um, you know we we had a tree nursery at the state board service we sold two million trees a year and our biggest buyer of trees was pheasant forever and they were planting windbreaks on the eastern plains and um, so you can't say fires is good are always bad or always good you can't say trees are always good or always bad and it, it just depends and it takes smart private landowners smart government agencies to uh, use whatever tools available but i think prescribed fire is for, for the scale of the problem probably the best thing okay. other questions yeah when did those beautiful prairie grasses bloom prairie grasses are they call them C4 grasses, I mean tall grasses. They have an extra pathway and they late, late blooms. So here in um, Larimer County, you see the big blue stem, I think it's peak probably around the first weekend of August, is that what I like? In Boulder, at the Boulder South Boulder Creek tall grass natural area, our big blue stem switchgrass peak around the middle of August turns into blue. A nice thing about the sand hills is it's green. It tends to be green all summer because of the way that the sand captures the precipitation with a high percentage of it. So even though they only get 20 or 22 inches a year, functionally it's worth a lot more than that. There's so much of the rain is going into the plant roots. So I wouldn't discourage you from going up there in August, although it can be hot. <laughs> but pick your times. And uh, it really helps if you get out early in the morning. And what I would suggest, I have a little guide here that goes with a book of how to explore the sand hills for the best advice I can give you. Get the Nebraska Delorm Atlas, find all the state wildlife areas and the national wildlife refuges. Get out to them at sunrise and at sunset, you'll fall in love. But I know people who say, well, I drove up there and I drove highway too uh, in the middle of the day and I don't see what all the fuss is about. <laughs> a lot of people can't see that as the landscape. There are, the majority of people in North uh, European Americans and North America can't see prairie. They don't see it at all. But, uh, so yeah, that's when I go out to see the blue tall grasses. I was up there that last weekend, and along the Crescent Lake Road, the uh, sand blue stem was eight feet high because they had a good wet spring and summer. Any other questions or thoughts? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. On that piece of rainbow in that one photo that went straight up vertically rather than curving. No. <laughs> the question is, why was that rainbow going straight up vertically rather than curving? You know, I don't think we think in three dimensions. It has something to do with the angle of the sun, right? And where you're standing and refraction. Can anyone explain that? Some rainbows go like this. I've seen ones, really low ones, you know. Anyone know? 
where the moisture is in the sky. It's where the moisture is in the sky. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? There's one over here. Okay. No. Last call. Well, thank you all. And I'll just hang around for a little while before the next COVID. So let me know if you have other questions. <laughs>